Warm water continues to build on the equator as El Nino strengthens its grip. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, May 21st. Storm surf, waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe, ring the bell, you get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. You can also donate a little money, if you choose, using the super thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And with that, I'd like to take a moment to thank folks that donated last week. Baja Bugs, thanks very much. M. Collins, Mark Collins I assume, thanks a lot. Brandon Campshire, Elliot Harris, Tim Caston, Sporeman, Jason, thanks a lot again. Tom Keir, Peter Carpenter. Adrian Anthony, uh, which really he donated for Cole and Jake, so thank you all a lot. And nice logo, of course. All right, thanks everyone, appreciate it. And with that, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, and we do see a gale here pushing out of the Southern California window. Southern California is about 117 west, so you draw a line right up there. And you can see most of this, uh, the seas in the 31-foot range are east of the Southern California window now, but they were in it earlier, and for Northern California too. So a little bit of swell from this is radiating north. Um, but energy from this system will continue for another day or so, which should produce surf for Chile, Peru, up into Central America. Nothing huge, but certainly maybe the first good pulse of swell for the winter season down there. We'll do a quick look at uh, current ca conditions in California and Hawaii, starting in Santa Cruz, buoy number 254. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy, anywhere from 33.3 second period, real long period energy, all the way down to five second period, pure wind chop. We see scattered little bits of energy, 20 seconds, 15 seconds, the whole way just the whole way across the spectrum. All this is a mixture of small wind swell and residual southern hemi and some new southern hemi swell trying to to uh, push in, but most of this is going to be much smaller than anything we've seen over the past week. Looking at the consolidation of all this energy, uh, peak energy, nine-tenths of a foot at 15.4 seconds from 209 degrees, that makes surf at about a foot and a half, and then some wind swell at 1.4 feet at nine seconds. Doing the same thing for Southern California, Point Loma South Buoy, number 191. Same sort of picture emerges, a little bump of energy at about 17 seconds, another one at 13, then mixed wind swell all scattered in there. Putting it all together, primary swell 1.5 feet at 15.8 seconds from 194 degrees. That would theoretically put surf at about two and a half foot, something like that. So thigh high, but you know, if you get to the right breaks, you can get maybe one and a half times that. So maybe chest high surf and then some secondary energy of one and a half feet at 12.6 seconds and that would be about two foot surf. Then we go over to the south shore of Oahu. We're actually using the lot in the Lanai buoy because it's more protected from any uh, wind swell that might be washing in there. Buoy number 239. And again, same sort of view, just scattered little bits of all kinds of small energy. Put it all together. Well, the wind swell looks like it's dominated two feet at 8.3 seconds from 162 degrees. That's about one and a half foot or so. And then the secondary energy, one foot at 16.5 seconds from 201 degrees and again about a foot and a half maybe eh, two to two and a half foot on the face at top spots going back in time we'll take a look and see what's been going on the past week we're going to start on monday the 15th of may with significant wave heights for the south pacific ocean notice the ice line here the antarctic ice line is about at eh, 65 south something like that um which is about normal for this time of year. Bit of energy traversed the South Pacific as we got into Tuesday and built on the far eastern edge of the Southern California swell window with 30 foot seas. This is 30.4 foot seas to be exact. Let's see if we get anything better than that. There we go. We got to 31.8 feet, but again, Southern California at about 117 west. So there. So this energy almost out of the Southern California swell window. Most of it aimed 
steamed off to the east and barely northeast. Some sideband energy is expected to radiate north into California for the, about a week later, so that'd be the middle of this coming week. You can see that system pushed up and then faded off of Patagonia. Nothing happened there. We're into Friday now. Another system built southeast of New Zealand, right off the edge of the ice line there with 33-foot seas, can convince uh, continued quickly traversing the Southeast Pacific into Saturday, the 20th of May, with seas in about the 32 foot range, and then built a little bit more as we got into late last night with 33 foot seas and then 34 foot seas. But you can see that just that one little circle right there. So basically 33 foot seas on the hairy edge of the Southern California swell window and then moving out from there. And that's where we are right now. All right, let's go look forward. So we'll start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a push in the jet to the north. And so here is the uh, northern branch of the jet stream. It's the southern branch that is really important. And Antarctica and the uh, uh, Ross ice, ice shelf are down here. Right under there, you can see New Zealand, Australia is off here. So the jet splits as it gets right over New Zealand, the southern branch crashing hard south into basically Antarctica, not allowing any support for gale development. When you get this split kind of jet stream flow, just like in the northern hemisphere, you end up with high pressure circulating counterclockwise. That does nothing for uh, real swell development. But you can see on today at this time, the jet pushing to the north and create and this is called a trough when the jet pushes to the north what that does is helps create a eddy here a clockwise eddy and that in the southern hemisphere that's a hallmark of low pressure and of course low pressure if it's strong enough generates winds and if it's circulating this way those winds over here on its west quadrant would be pushing north and that would create fetch aimed at North America and, of course, Chile and Peru. And, of course, if the low pressure is strong enough, it generates those winds and the winds start getting traction on the ocean surface and they create seas. As the seas radiate away from the fetch area, they eventually get groomed out, turn into swell. And swell when it hits your beach, of course, turns into surf. So a little bit of hope here on uh, Sunday. And let's see how far that goes. Nope, by Monday, look at the trough pushing totally out of the Southern California swell window. Aimed well, though, at Chile, Peru, Central America. And look at this, the trough pushing right up to Patagonia as we get into Tuesday and then pushing inland there maybe early Wednesday morning. So a good run of swell from the system would seem likely just looking at the jet stream. We haven't even looked down at the surface or the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. Look at that, another little trough again off Patagonia. So we get into Thursday, but down here, the jet basically all pushing to the south. That just does nothing. We know the ice line's right here at about 65 south. So whatever trough there would have to be, it would have to be north of 65 south in ice-free waters to get meaningful traction on the ocean surface. We don't see that. So we're out to Saturday, the 27th of May, and we see a little bit of a trough trying to organize about a week from now. Winds not pushing very hard to the north. I mean, only 100 knots. Probably not too meaningful. And there we are a week out. So remote hope in the Southeast Pacific again uh, a week from now. All right, so that was the jet stream level, and that was our best guess at what's going on at the surface, but we do actually have surface models. You need actual wind blowing on the ocean surface to get traction and create waves. So on Sunday right now, we see fetch 35 to 40 knots. The secondary fetch here also in the far southeast Pacific, again, in Southern California at 117, uh, Santa Cruz about 122. So you can kind of see some of this energy already out of the swell window. Next fetch, trying to build in and it gets a little more traction first thing uh well this is actually zero z that would be about 5 p.m on sunday which it is right now so uh that fetch quickly moving out of the southern california swell window targeting south america and doing a quite good job and getting quite close probably a little too close resulting in rather raw swell but you know where to go if you live there 
find your best protected break. All right, as we get into uh, Tuesday evening, gale, actually a storm of 50 knot winds develops. But look at that, just falling quick south and quickly over the Ross ice shelf, offering nothing of any interest. We're looking for anything greater than really 40 knot winds, so that second shade of orange. Don't see it under New Zealand? Yes, 50 knot winds. But again, that's falling southeast. You need to have systems pushing off to the northeast to really get you know, a good push like a bulldozer pushing the ocean off to the northeast. That's what we're looking for. Then theoretically on Saturday, another little gale forecast here right on the edge of the Ross Ice Shelf pushing across. I guess that's in response to that trough building in the area. On Sunday, 40 knot winds aimed well off to the north. Hey, there's some hope. Then they quickly fade to 35 knots. So that's really, you know, maybe 14 or 15 second period swell, just eyeballing it here and fading from there. So not a whole lot there, but at least a little hope. Let's go look at the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. And here we go. Significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean. Again, the gale that we were looking at earlier, and then another system falling south east. Now, here we go. Again, this is out of the Southern California swell window, but relative to Chile and Peru and Central America, well, 33 foot seas, 33.8 foot seas, all aimed well off to the northeast as we get Monday night into Tuesday, pushing very close to southern, uh, well, into Chile, I'd say, with nearly 30-foot seas, and then fading out. Our next little system out here, we saw that on Wednesday, falling deep to the south. Now, we know there's another system forecast somewhere here, right about there as we get into Saturday. Let's see. There we go. 30, really tiny system, the 31-foot seas, pushing east across, just north of the Ross Ice Shelf, and then lifting north as we get into, whoops, oh, there we go. We'll say right there. And that's what, about 27, 28 foot seas. So maybe some hope, just looking back here. Yeah, we got 28 foot seas. So we'll say 15, maybe 16 second period swell from that somewhere a week or so after that relative to California. Now, before we get go any further, you notice that the storm pattern of late has all been focused on the Southeast Pacific. That is pretty typical of La Nina years. And you say, well, we're not in La Nina anymore. Well, officially, we're kind of neutral, right? We're not in El Nino yet, but we're getting there. But atmospherically, and I've talked about this in the past, there's this lag where if you've been in La Nina and all of a sudden the underpinnings of La Nina fade out, which they have, the atmosphere doesn't know it. It takes a while. It has momentum. It just doesn't stop on a dime. So atmosphere, I mean, you know, oceanic speaking, we're neutral, right? But the atmosphere has been in La Nina for three years. The jet stream in southern, in the southern hemisphere in summer months, just, you know, it typically would be displaced pretty far to the south. And the typical place that you would see it lift to the north and create a trough would be in the southeast Pacific. And I mean, we've had four or five now systems, I wouldn't call them storms, but gales that have produced some sort of rideable swell all located as far on the edge of the Southern California swell window as you can get. And that still seems to be the pattern. The point being, that is an indicator that La Nina is still in control of the atmosphere. Now, there's another indicator of that, too. Some of this is seasonal, some of it not. But we're looking at winds. We're just looking at the local wind forecast for California and for Hawaii. And, of course, the topic of conversation whenever you're in the water is, Darn, the water's been cold lately. Well, it's actually been okay the past week or two, but I mean, this whole spring and so far, it's been just not particularly pleasant. What causes that? Northwest winds just creating massive upwelling. South winds along the California coast do not create upwelling. Northwest winds absolutely do. Now, the question is, is that upwelling isolated to the immediate area of where the winds are, or does it branch out a little bit further than that? So we're going to get a test of that this week. All right, so here we are Sunday. Little fetch, northwest winds at 20, 25 knots off of northern California, maybe 20 knots off of central California. Pretty much typical trades for Hawaii. But as we get into Monday, boom, here we go. 30 to 35 knot northwest winds. I mean, this is not atypical. It's the standard pressure gradient, right? High pressure 
pressure in the Gulf of Alaska, heat low inland, tightens up the isobars, starts pumping wind, and that's great, but it also creates upwelling, creates wind swell that'll radiate down to uh, into central California, probably not make it uh, meaningfully around Point Conception. Local trades for the Hawaiian Islands. So the expectation is if this goes... There will be certainly cold water, we'll say, north of the Golden Gate. But the next question is, how far south does it reach? I don't know. I'm not going to make a guess. I'd like to think that at least Santa Cruz is protected, but we'll see. As we get into Tuesday, 35, that's that's gale force winds steady for all of Northern California. 30 knot winds down to the Golden Gate, 25 knot winds off the coast. My guess is there's probably going to be some south flow here. This is the typical eddy thing. You get high pressure here. You can see the heat low here, and that will create a little south flow pushing up here. And that might prevent the gradient or prevent the upwelling locally to maybe be limited to Ocean Beach and points north of there. Anyway, trades for the Hawaiian Islands. 15 knots. We'll just go through this Wednesday. Pretty much the same deal. The gradient fades some 30 knot north winds, uh, likely a southerly flow pushing up to at least Bodega Bay, if not Point Arena. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands. So we get into Thursday. Hey, finally, northwest winds fade. Northwest wind swell fades. Things looking better. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, same deal. Light wind regime for California. Trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Saturday, though, look, here comes some high pressure. You see the wind starting to build. Will it make it down into California? Well, we get into Sunday, and maybe not. Interesting, the models a day ago had suggested another northwest wind event for northern California a week from now. Today's run, not showing it. So who knows? Something to watch. But the real interesting point's going to be how far south does the upwelling cold water get relative to this uh, uh, northwest wind event that's happening over the next couple of days? Well, we'll just look at the buoys and we'll we'll see, get a sense. But my suspicion is it'll make it down to pretty close to at least Santa Cruz. Snow forecast dashboard for Squaw Valley. Why am I looking at that? Well, clearly there's not going to be any snow, but we're looking at snow levels and we're looking at the big melt, you know, all the feet and tens of feet of snow up in the high Sierra above maybe 8,000 feet, something like that. So the freezing line here, the intersection of the gray and the white line, that's 32 degrees, is at 12,500 feet. I mean, this is the top of, uh, um, uh, Olympic Valley right here. This is the base of it. So clearly above freezing temperatures. Notice, but if you're doing, if you're trying to do something crazy like hike the JMT or the Pacific Crest Trail or something like that this time of year, which is, would be pretty much pure insanity given the, the amount of snowpack that's up there. Um, we see very high freeze lines, but the temper, the freezing line going down to about the 10,500 foot range from about May 23rd through about you know, somewhere into maybe the 28th, and then heading back up to the 12,000 plus foot range from there. So a melt will continue, but maybe not as intense for the middle of this period, and then getting a little bit stronger. Right now, I've not heard any reports of any serious flooding like in Yosemite Valley, but it, it's right on the hairy edge. If this uh, freeze line were to go way high, like up to 14,000 feet, I'd certainly be worried that there would be a significant flooding event. But right now, so far, things are looking okay, melting steadily, but not uh, pr pr super fast. All right, so surf spot forecast for a couple locations, Half Moon Bay, generally northern California. Uh, surf five to seven feet, something like that for a couple days. All this pure wind swell and then fading out. And then you get a little bump out here at like two and a half to three feet. Let's go look at the details. The actual swell height, six feet, and this is the period down here, nine, ten seconds. So all wind swell pretty much the whole way into... Well, it says Saturday here, but I think there's going to be bits and pieces of it scattered underneath. Uh, and then one and a half to maybe two foot of swell at 16 seconds from the south uh, for the weekend 
yeah, for the weekend. Santa Cruz, the same pattern. Surf not as high because the swell's got a wrap in there and, uh, you know, but it's all wind swell. Five feet, that's probably grossly overstating it. And then you can see the two foot stuff sort of peeking out. To, so it leads me to believe that there's actually some southern hemi swell there. And you can see it, yes, starting again on Saturday into Sunday through the weekend. Uh, one and a half feet at 16 seconds. San Diego, well, really small, one foot, something like that. And then you almost think that's probably wind swell or maybe there actually there is some swells forecast to get in. It's You don't see it as well up in Northern California because it's masked by the wind swell. But let's go look at the details here. So yeah, wind swell in the nine second period range. And then you get actually late Wednesday, I think it starts, you know, with some not, you know, one foot at 19 seconds or something like that. Anyway, then you get a long run of small Southern Hemi swell with swell sizes in the one and a half to two foot range at 15 to 16 seconds so a little bit of a break you work and then by mid to later in the week small surf to go ride and then south facing shores on the hawaiian islands small surf the whole way through let's go take a look at the swell here well wind swell five six seconds but then you see a little bit of uh southern hemi swell trying to sneak in again in the wednesday thursday time frame nothing huge 1.3 feet at 14 seconds which is good for one and a half to maybe two foot surf something like that so rideable but nothing more so let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden Julian Oscillation and the El Nino Southern Oscillation? These two weather oscillations are the biggest determiners of support for gale and therefore swell development, either in the North Pacific or the South Pacific. We're going to start by looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO, the Madden Julian Oscillation. Why would I care about that? Well, the MJO, let's get a little background in that. There's two phases to it, an active and an inactive phase. And basically, the active phase is like a low-pressure system. The inactive phase is like a high-pressure system. And these two phases rotate around the planet from west to east on the equator. Uh, the low-pressure active phase on one side of the planet, the high-pressure inactive phase on the other. When the active phase starts moving into the west, over the west Pacific, what it does is it starts dampening trade winds. And that's important because that can affect the transport of warm water. But let's start with something more basic. What it does is it's, because it's low pressure, it starts dragging or pulling or sucking warm moist air in the west pacific up into the atmosphere eventually that air hits the jet stream it supercharges the jet stream or at least can enhance it and the stronger the jet stream the better the odds for creating troughs which in turn support gales which create surf okay the other major part of the active phase is if it's strong enough it dampens trade winds. I mean, high pressure is what creates trade winds, high pressure in the North Pacific and the South Pacific, and they create a current going east to west along the equator. But when the active phase of the MJO pushes into the West Pacific, it starts dampening those trade winds. When that happens, warm water that's typically balled up over in the far equatorial West Pacific starts easing or seeping east in a, in a ball or a bolus of warm water known as a Kelvin wave. The Kelvin wave travels under the equator following the thermocline. The whole way across the Pacific takes about three months to get there, and it has to be driven by a pretty solid, robust, active phase of the MJO. But eventually that bolus of warm water will impact Ecuador and the Galapagos, push to the surface, erupt, create a warm water slick there. If you have successive active phases of the MJO, they can create successive Kelvin waves. And that's what ushers in El Nino, because once all that warm water starts building up in the far east Pacific on the equator, it too starts rising, evaporating, and then that 
feeds the jet stream there. And what it does, it changes a thing called the Walker circulation. I'm not going to get into all those details, but the short of it is that's how you get El Nino. That creates a much stormier pattern in the Pacific, and it creates a more of a high pressure setup over Indonesia. And you sort of get the reverse of where we have been the past three years. The past three years, all the storm activity has been in the Indian Ocean and over Africa, and it's been a high pressure lockdown in the Pacific. We are now transitioning with low pressure moving over the Pacific and getting established and a high pressure regime setting up over Indonesia. That is what's known as El Nino. All right. So all that aside, what are we looking at here? We're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino by looking for temperatures and those things we call Kelvin waves. But there are also wind sensors on those buoys. Remember, the active phase of the MGO dampens trade winds. So we're just looking at the arrows here and winds look pretty. Oh, oh and let's get oriented here. The equator right there. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. That's New Guinea. Dateline is right there. In the East Pacific, winds are just looking at the lengths of the arrow, pretty strong out of the east. Over the Central Pacific, pretty strong out of the east. In the what we call the Kelvin wave generation area, when the active phase is well, 170 west, there's the dateline. So in the West Pacific, this is where if you get westerly anomalies, and we're going to get into that in a minute, where if the trade winds start weakening here, that's where warm water that's all here starts sloshing east. So trades right now, well, they're blowing, but kind of modest in the Kelvin wave generation area. Now, it's not the actual wind speeds that matter. Remember, I just said the word anomaly. What's that mean? Difference from normal for this time of year. What are the winds doing in the East Pacific? Well, these winds are still blowing lightly stronger than normal in the east, but they're dead neutral. If not, oh, there's one little arrow out of the west, so slightly westerly anomalies in the central Pacific, but it's really, it's the Kelvin wave generation area right in here where if you get the active phase, that's where you get those Kelvin waves, and that's what we want to see. And sure enough, look at that. Little bits of arrows, not strong, but light westerly winds in this area, suggesting that the active phase of the MJO is moving over the far west Pacific. That's good news. What's the forecast for the next two weeks? All right, so this is the east-west component of the wind. This, the blues, are easterly anomalies. Consider that the inactive phase of the MJO. The reds, westerly anomalies. That's the active phase of the MJO. And this, but this is the whole planet, okay? We, the Pacific starts about 125 east, so right there. That would be... Um, uh, New Guinea, something like that, even maybe a little bit um, um, west of there. The Kelvin wave generation area ends about 170 west, so about right there. And what do we see? Well, we see westerly anomalies pushing into the West Pacific starting about May 10th. They've been building. They're peaking right now, very strong. But here's the even better news. They're supposed to hold in some fashion filling the most part of the Kelvin wave generation area for the next two weeks. Certainly looks like the active phase of the MJO is in control. That's exactly what we want to see. Here's actual wind speeds in the Kelvin wave generation area from the, CA, uh, from the GFS model. All right, there's the equator. New Guinea's right there and associated islands. Uh, the Kelvin wave generation area actually ends east of this thing. But you can see this dynamic going on. East winds blowing, what's the yellow there, about 12 knots, something like that, 10 to 12 knots. Gets kind of uh, neutral here at 165 west, but here is westerly winds, if not a westerly wind burst, actual winds blowing from the west, and that has created vorticity and a some sort of a typhoon system. I haven't act, even done the research to see what it is, but clearly there's some sort of a typhoon developing. It's radiating north up at, out of this area. We'll put this into motion and see. There you go. And we see westerly winds in some fashion. There's more of them continuing into Tuesday. And then what do we get on Wednesday? Just kind of a neutral. There's more westerly winds as we're even into Friday. Saturday, Sunday, and I think that's where this ends. So quite a, a bit of western, not even anomalies, actual 
full-on westerly winds, that would be a westerly wind burst. And that's pretty much what the, CF, what the GFS model, the anomaly portion of it was showing, we're seeing real west winds on the ground, or at least forecast. All right, so let's look at another dimension of this. Outgoing long wave radiation right there, OLR. Basically, cloud cover. If the active phase of the MJO is a low pressure system, and well, low pressure systems typically create clouds, right? So what do I, what are we looking at here? South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, the equator right there, 180 west, that's the dateline, Kelvin wave generation area right here. The blue means negative anomalies, less sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface being reflected out into the atmosphere, outgoing long wave radiation. So this is the active phase of the MJO. Now this is a statistic model that suggests the inactive phase is in the Indian Ocean here. All right. The active phase supposedly fading in five days, pretty much gone 10 days from now, and the inactive phase of the MJO in control, according to the statistic model. Now, the dynamic model says active, 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 active for the next two weeks. Look at the difference between the statistic model, the last day at 15 days out, and the dynamic model. Clearly, the dynamic model is what we want to see, and we think odds are, given that we're in a... El Nino-ish building situation, the dynamic model probably has a better handle on it. So we drill down on those two models. We're looking at the phase diagram from the statistic model and the dynamic model. What's the phase diagram? It just shows you where the active phase of the MJO is and how strong it is. So the MJO moves from the west-east, from the Indian Ocean to the maritime continent, that'd be like Bali, to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. Start here. What is this? April 12th. You can see where the active phase has been. And we got into May. And the heavy dot is where it is right now. So, and the further that dot is away from this circle, the stronger it is. So we'll say a modest active phase of the MJO in the West Pacific. And these three lines are the forecast tracks. Uh, all of them suggesting the active phase moving somewhere over we'll say Africa and anywhere from dead weak to moderately strong two weeks from now. The statistic model, mean, I mean the dynamic model, meanwhile has, look at this, the active phase just completely locked and building to moderate strength in the West Pacific maybe seven days from now, crashing back down and just noodling around right here in the West Pacific for the next two weeks. I mean, that's this is pretty much typical El Nino uh, uh, pattern. It effectively, during El Nino, it's like you have this active phase of the MJO. The more the uh, El Nino signal gets established in the Pacific, it turns into just a perpetual active phase of the MJO developing over the West Pacific. That's exactly what this model suggests. Keep that in mind as we get into some of the longer range models in just a minute. The upper level model showing areas favorable for precipitation, greens favorable, yellows and oranges not favorable. This is South America, that's Central America, Hawaii is a pixel there, the equator is right there, New Guinea there, so Kelvin wave generation area roughly here, and this goes out 40 days. Now remember, this is the statistic model, it shows active phase over the Pacific today, continuing and fading slowly into about June 5th and then gone inactive phase in control through about, oh, uh, what was that, June 20th, then a weak active phase building after that into the latter part of June and early July. But we think the statistic model does not have a handle on what's going on and just consider that. So then that gets us to the CFS model, and this one goes out one month. Again, this is the same thing, east-west component of the wind. The blues, easterly anomalies, inactive phase. The reds, active phase. This is past history here. This is the forecast down here. The west Pacific starts about 125 east, so right here. Goes to the Kelvin wave generation area, ends about 170 west, so about here. California is at 120, and uh, Ecuador and the Galapagos about 80 west, so roughly there. Now, the solid line is the active phase of the MJO. 
Remember, I said during El Nino, it's like you have a perpetual active phase of the MJO going on. Or in the early parts of El Nino, you, ha you have a series of active phases of the, the MJO that create Kelvin waves that push successive uh, Kelvin waves across the Pacific, starting to warm the East Pacific. Well, here we are back in February. Actually, there, I think, was another active phase even in December. But here's one that pushed the whole way across the Pacific. And another baby one in March and April that created a Kelvin wave. And then another now, we're at May, strong, uh, strong, solid active phase of the MJO. Here's where we are today. Look at the westerly anomaly forecast, just holding solid into the 3rd of June, if not even later, and making it the whole way almost to a point south of California. Then after that, there is this little inactive phase of the MJO forecast in the early part of June. But look at this, westerly anomalies holding, and at least neutral anomalies holding over not only just the Kelvin wave generation area, but the whole way filling the entire Pacific. This is smelling like a developing El Nino with a footprint getting well established in the, not just the West Pacific, but the entirety of the Pacific before we're even into the early part of June. And then the CFS model going out three months. There is a giant blinking bullseye on this chart. But before I draw your attention there, let's just get ourselves oriented. This is the pass down here. This is the east-west component of the wind. Again, the blues, easterly anomalies, inactive phase of the MJO. The yellows, westerly anomalies, the active phase of the MJO. So here is actually the second Kelvin wave. You can just sort of out see it outlined there in February. The third in March and April. The fourth happening right now. There's that peak of it forecast for the next you know, week or so. But look what happens after this active phase fades. What's this? Where are the blues? See, it's blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow. And then it just goes yellow, yellow, orange, red, and just stays that way off the end of the chart. And this is not some anomaly like one time on this model. It's been consistently hinting at this. What this is really saying, in fact, let's overlay the MJO. All right, here's the phases of the MJO, just like we said. The red contours, the active phase of the MJO. Dotted contours, inactive phase. So active phase, westerly anomalies. Inactive phase, easterly anomalies. Active phase, westerly anomalies, you get it. Here's our current active phase. But then we get this inactive phase. But westerly anomalies not only build, but look at this, they're full raging supposedly as we get by the to the end of June. And then a mega active phase sets in, or maybe it's two active phases, who knows? But remember I was saying before, when you get into El Nino and it's a solid El Nino, it's like it's just a perpetual active phase of the MJO. Very much. This looks like that's what's happening. And here even suggests with the inactive phase, it the inactive phase isn't strong enough. The, uh, the El Nino signal trumps it and stomps on it, just says, no, I'm going to continue to produce westerly anomalies for the foreseeable future, which means just every drop of warm water that's over in, in uh, Indonesia and the maritime continent is going to get squeezed out and pushed to the east towards the Galapagos. That's classic El Nino kind of development material. Now, let's overlay one more thing, the low-pass filter. So this is the high-pressure, low-pressure bias, the dotted contour, high-pressure bias, okay? Right over the date line, this was back in February, you see it just steadily seeping out of the picture and getting weaker. It had multiple contours at one point. Now it's down to one contour as of May 21st. East of even the Kelvin wave generation area, California is at 120. By, you know, July, it's supposed to be centered over California. And my guess is it will be gone as we get into fall. Well, likewise, the solid contour, the low pressure bias, this is the El La Nina, this is the El Nino signal here. Well, it's already at two contours, set, centered roughly 
right about, I don't know, 160 east or something, right smack in the middle of the Kelvin wave generation area. Forecast building to three contours, forecast building to four contours. No wonder westerly anomalies are forecast to be raging. I mean, this is all strong. This is a full-on, not westerly anomalies. These are full-on westerly winds just setting right in the middle of the Kelvin wave generation area. So, a very impressive model forecast. And yeah, it's been varying a little bit from day to day, but the past couple of days, it's locked solid in this sort of position. All right, so what's going on in the ocean down? We've talked about Kelvin waves. Can we visualize and can we see and what's the status of warm water movement? And that's what we're looking at. Again, that those buoys, the TAO buoy array, they were established to look for Kelvin waves. This was a, pro, a government funded project, a United States government funded project. And I think they had joint partners from uh, other uh, Pacific centered nations to string buoys across the equator these are the actual anchor lines on those buoys. The X's are sensors on those anchor lines to get a sense of is warm water sloshing east or west. Okay, you can clearly see the 29, oh, the 30 degree isotherm. Haven't seen this because this sector has been dead, but it now creeps into the picture. First time we've seen that. That's good news. The 29 degree isotherm last week was maybe 178 west. It's moving to 176, almost 175 west. So warm water moving there. The 28 degree isotherm a couple of weeks ago was real shallow. You know, it was here in the west, kind of just barely on the surface. Now it's getting deeper and bigger. And of course, the 24 degree isotherm just rock solid the whole way across the Pacific. So just eyeballing this without any other data, you go, there's a lot of warm water that has has been and is still moving off to the east. But we also have a chart of the anomalies, the difference from normal for this time of year. Well, we see two degree, three, three degree anomaly in the West Pacific, positive anomalies, three degrees above normal, and then connecting to a big giant bolus of warm water. I mean, this is, we're not even in Kelvin wave territory anymore. This is just a river of warm water. You can't even make out where one Kelvin wave starts and another ends. It's just a flow of warm water. And as the warm water starts working its way up the thermocline, it actually gets warmer. And then it collides with existing other warm water off of Ecuador, just turns into a raging ball of warm water. So it takes three months to go from here to here. Looks like there's at least three months more of warm water and probably a lot more in the pipe. Here's another model, same thing. It, the technology for building this is a little bit different. We're not even going to show the chart because it's basically the same as it's been for weeks, but it's just showing steady warm water at depth, all culminating in some massive pool right off of Ecuador. Now, notice there is a little bit of a pause right in there, not quite as intense, and you'll see why I mentioned that in a minute. And then sort of the time phase chart here. This is the West Pacific here. This is the East Pacific here. Blues are lower than normal temperatures. We're going back a year ago. There was one Kelvin wave. You see warm water pushing across the Pacific. But cold water persisted off of Ecuador. And after that, Kelvin wave faded. Massive cool upreeling response. Another weak Kelvin wave back in December. That was We'll call that Kelvin wave number one. This was Kelvin wave number two in January, February. Kelvin wave number three in March. Another one somewhere there. And we think there's another forming right now. There is your mega river of warm water sloshing off to the east. We're just waiting for that to start affecting the atmosphere above it. And like I sort of said before, the atmosphere, once it's set in motion and has momentum, it's got three years of La Nina momentum behind it. So it's not going to just change on a dime. But we think that is starting to happen. And the more this warm water builds up in the East Pacific, the more it's going to make a dent in that pre-existing La Nina momentum pattern and start eventually canceling it out. And eventually, at some point, the atmosphere will, and I'm guessing that's going to be in the late July time frame, it's just going to go, uh, 
I think La Nina is dead. I think it's time to move to something else. And then the gradual buildup. It's not going to happen overnight like zero to hero. It's going to be a slow, steady build starting somewhere around mid to late July. And then the, the drumbeat of El Nino will just start building and building in the atmosphere. The question is, how strong will it be? When will it peak out? We have some guesses, but, um, you know, it's a little bit early to get super excited, but clearly the trend is moving away from La Nina, at least to Enso Neutral, and more than likely towards El Nino. All right, so that was subsurface water temperatures. We were looking for signs of Kelvin waves. We clearly see that, a river of water moving under the equator. All right. What's going on in the ocean surface? Because it is what happens on the surface that affects the atmosphere above it. Whatever happens down under the surface, the atmosphere doesn't care. It It's all about evaporation and rising air. And it's either lifting air or it's sinking air. Sinking air is high pressure, not good for storm production. Rising moist warm air is great for storm production, but it has to stay and rise for months to really get the jet stream to change its configuration. All right, so what are we looking at here? South America, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Hawaii out there, equator right here. The reds and yellows, warmer than normal temperatures. The blues, colder than normal temperatures. Clear uh, um, Kelvin wave impact area right here. You can see the smoking reds. They've been there for quite a while now. But we also see what was here getting caught by the trades. The trades have not died here in the East Pacific. They're taking this water, pushing it along the equator. So we've been measuring how far west across the equator this goes. Today we're at 150, maybe 155 west. So a steady westward progression of warm water. Why do I mention that? Well, there's an official El Nino monitoring region. They call it the Nino 3.4 region. Nino 1.2 is right here. Pretty noisy area. Temperatures bounce around. Nino 3 is out here. Nino 4 is out here. But the intersection of the two from 120 west. So California is right there. So right on the equator, just five degrees north and south of the equator. This is the official El Nino monitoring region. We see the warm water, the really good warm water, making it about, meh, probably two-thirds of the way through the El, uh, the Nino 3.4 area. So this signals a building uh, El Nino water temperature pattern. Again, it does not talk to what's happening in the jet stream above it. Now, also notice, here is that again, that anomalous upwelling pattern thing going on along California. It seems to have been getting better lately. Warm temperatures building, but we know, well, here comes a gradient. There's going to be a bunch of turbulence and upwelling, at least up in here. The question is, will that, will the, all, will that affect down here? And I suspect probably not. I suspect a little bit at a time. I mean, some of this is just seasonal, too. Springtime's always windy in California. There's always upwelling. During La Nina years, it's way worse. During El Nino years, it's like almost nothing. It's like it doesn't even happen. And then what happens is if you don't have that north winds and you don't have the upwelling, water temperatures, the sun just starts baking the ocean. It starts warming up, and bingo, then you are you don't need your five mil suit up north. You're in, you're in a spring suit in Southern California. We don't think that's going to happen quite yet, but notice warm water is building up to Baja and even a little bit north of there. I mean, it's trying still a little bit earlier in the game. I think it's going to be more later June sort of thing till we really get out of this upwelling pat pattern in earnest. Sea surface temperature trend. Well, okay, so here is, um, I'm sorry, Peru and Ecuador and the Galapagos. And the temperature trend here, maybe the blues just cooling just a little bit. I mean, we're still getting the Kelvin waves. They're erupting. But remember, we said there was a little break, you know, like the bolus of warm water wasn't quite fully impacting Ecuador yet. We think that's contributing to some of this. But I, I'm, I'm also thinking 
that this is really going to start warming up this area again with all that warm water in play. We'll see another little spike of warming in this area. Now we see sort of a weak warming trend out here to the dateline. So for right now, the pattern's kind of static, sort of a pause in the action. I think some of that is related to the inactive phase of the MJO that's in control and making its way across the East Pacific right now. But we know over here, the active phase of the MJO is building. And as that, remember, it moves from west to east on the equator. So as the active phase moves its way over here, trades will drop in this area. Remember, trades were blowing a little bit, creating another sort of an upwelling mixing of the surface. Westerly winds will dampen or westerly anomalies will dampen that. I bet you you'll see these temperatures start to rise. Give it another week or two. And then finally, the and then finally, the overview picture, again, warming off of Peru and Ecuador. Temperatures pushing into, there we go, here's the box bounding the Nino 3.4 region right there. Temperatures building, being caught by uh, the warm water, being caught by the trades, dragged into the Nino 3.4 region, all setting up the potential demise of the last of the, or, or of the La Nino momentum in the atmosphere as the ocean and the subsurface ocean transition towards El Nino. A quick look at currents on the uh, uh, ocean's surface, all right? Westerly winds, westerly anomalies change the current direction. So we see here, look at this easterly current. I don't know whether, maybe I can zoom in a little bit more and just give this, there we go. Easterly current off of Ecuador, again, inactive phase of the MJO, probably enhancing trades in this area. But over here, westerly current just pushing right in. So if you already have cooking warm waters here and you're getting westerly anomalies, that's only going to prevent mixing and let the sun cook this surface. And we know that warm water from El Kelvin wave eruption over here is pushing this way as well. So things looking pretty good here. Let's go off to the central Pacific. And there we go. We see, well, the west current continues to, I'm not sure if I can get this. That's uh, 166 west right there. And we see kind of a mixed light current. And then we go over here into the far west Pacific and right on the equator and even up here above, westerly current setting up. So the transition looks like it's happening. During El Nino, all this current was just hard from east to west. Now we're seeing definite signs of building westerly current across the equator. Sea surface temperatures in the Nino 1.2 region, well, let's see, they've been up, they were up to almost like 2.9 degrees back in early April, then just been toggling somewhere right above 2 degrees. We think, see, notice the drop today, plus 1.729, I mean, that's still cooking hot for this region, but down a little the past one, two, three, four days. We think that is, again, little vestiges of the inactive phase of the MJO. We think this will be turning up at some point. And the Nino 3.4 index, well, the same sort of deal here going one, two, three, four, five, six days of slightly decreasing temperatures. We, we sort of did a thing on uh, Instagram, and you can follow us on Instagram. I think it's stormsurf001 on Instagram. Um, we hit here we were up at half a degree above normal the cutoff before being enso neutral is half a degree above neutral to half a degree below normal if you're in there you're enso neutral when you get above half a degree you're moving into el nino territory well like two or three days after I said, oh, looks like we're moving in the right direction. Boom. Now we're down to 385 thousandths of a degree above normal. Just, you know, a tenth or, uh, or so of a degree below neutral. But again, we think we're going to be heading right back up. There'll be a little dip and stuff around here. But there is way too much warm water and way too much active MJO activity for this to be anything but getting warmer. So we talked about this interaction between one, the MJO, creating two, Kelvin waves, which go under the ocean surface, which then erupt off of Ecuador, that warm the ocean surface off of Ecuador, then get caught by the trades in that warm water strings back west over the equator, which then in turn creates evaporation, which then starts getting sucked up into the atmosphere, which then starts changing the 
jet stream configuration over the Pacific. All right, this is the Southern Oscillation Index. Difference in pressure between Tahiti and Darwin. Darwin, Australia, pretty much in the Indian Ocean. Tahiti in the Central um, Pacific. So if, if you're in El Nino, pressure would start dropping over Tahiti and this index would go negative. If you're in La Nina, pressure is higher over Tahiti, the index goes positive. Today, we're at minus 25.87. One day does not a trend make, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, whatever it is. We have a pretty good long run of negative numbers here, suggesting at minimum, the active phase of the MJO is affecting the West Pacific. Then we just go back in time and look, and well, we had another little run of this going back in April, likely also associated with the active phase of the MJO. So it's probably active, inactive, going active again. Now, the 30-day average kind of smooths the noise out here. It's, well, at minus 7.80, not too bad. And just looking at the trend, well, we were down at minus two. We kind of went inactive and it went up to about zero. Now we're dropping. Certainly looks like the pattern's moving in the right direction. The 90 day average. Now that's 90 days out. We think this whole, you know, going negative thing's only been going on about a month or so, just a little bit longer. So it's probably not hitting this, but still the 90 day average minus 3.09. Where was it a month ago? Plus 3.36. All indicators are that the jet stream is at least sensing that something's going on in the Pacific. It hasn't fully picked up on the magnitude of the changes happening in the ocean, but clearly it's starting to sense that something's going on. Here's the 30-day moving SOI graphed out. The downward spikes are the active phase of the MJO. The upward spikes are the inactive phase of the MJO. During La Nina, the, active phase, uh, the inactive phase of the MJO is more dominant. You can see this. January 21, the trend, just look at it. It's been an upward, nonstop trend until it peaked out at like 20 and just sat there for almost a year till January 2023, and then look what's been happening. Just a precipitous drop in the, uh, the SOI since the 1st of January, all signaling the demise of La Nina, and we assume the transition to El Nino. So where is all this going? We're looking at the sea surface temperature anomaly in the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region in the area right there south of California out to about the dateline on the equator from the CFS version 2 model. Well, here was the negative La Nina trend in 2022, early part of 23. We went completely neutral in about, what's that, uh, late March of this year. Right now, here's where we are, right at the transition to... Uh, uh, El Nino in the, we'll say, mid-May time frame, something like that. And as we get into June, the transition to, into El Nino. Now, this is the raw data. By July, anomaly is 1.3, maybe 1.35 degrees above normal. And then building to 2.3 or 2.25 degrees above normal in, like, November and then starting to fade out in January. Peak of El Nino from a sea surface temperature perspective right here. Now this is the raw data. The PDF corrected tries to mute some of the more out there uh, projections that the CFS model can give, but still it's saying basically the same thing. By July, temperatures at 1.05 degrees above normal, and then as you get into November, October, temperatures 1.75, 1.8 degrees above normal. Super El Nino territory is about 2.1 degrees, something like that. I'm, I'm sort of guessing because I'm not really sure. But once you get above 2 degrees, you're in super El Nino territory. I suspect we're going to be there. I think this is a little bit on the conservative side. But let's go put this model in perspective with a whole bunch of other models. Here is the sea surface temperature forecast for the Nino 3.4 region from every model on the planet. A whole stack of dynamic models here, a whole stack of statistic models. The statistic models probably are more conservative than the dynamic models. Okay, the dynamic model average right here says temperatures getting to 1.67 degrees. The uh, 
the statistic average says only 0.45 of degrees. That's just completely unbelievable and not even, I, I, I don't even put any stock in that based on what's happening, based on years of following Kelvin waves and MJO. We're in a major event here. Even this seems low to me. Now, the uh, CFS model, there it is right there, which is, okay, so maybe we can get the light up right there, says temperatures 2.234. Now, notice this is sort of on the high side of all the models, but I suspect it's probably pretty close to right. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but here's May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, January. Here's the various, these are the uh, dynamic models. Here's their individual sea surface temperature forecasts in the October time frame, 1.82 to 2.4 by the GDFL, um, 2.34 by the CFS version 2, and that's probably the not PDF corrected version of it. Okay, then you go down and look at the statistic models. There, the biggest ones are saying, well, maybe a degree above normal, nine tenths. Okay, if you put all, oh, the average of the dynamic models peaks it out at about 1.67 in the where is that that's october time frame peak of the statistic models say 1.16 oh no 1.2 in <laughs> august not believable either way you see the spread here so where do you want to put your money which model do you want to put it on i don't know you know make your guesses i'm going with the cfs model because it seems to have done a pretty good job in the past and so i'm sticking with it and uh, with its temperature at 2.3 i don't know i'm not really a betting man so i'll bet one penny on it but we'll see if that happens that puts us in super el nino territory oh and the one thing i didn't show you sea surface temperature anomalies during here it is may 1997 okay here so basically yesterday here's what the temperature pattern looked like during what was what I would consider the gold standard of El Ninos, super, uh, the gold standard of super El Ninos. Here's what was happening on May 20th now of 1997. So let's see if we can do this. And here is what was, what's happening today. Okay. And we'll go back and forth here. A little bit stronger temperatures here, but this is what we looked like uh, about a month ago. Much larger development in terms of width out here into the Nino 3.4 region. Also notice, look at the kind of just mixed pattern here and down here. And then look at the how much warm water and look at how much further developed the El Nino triangle is, or anvil, depending on what you call it, this year compared to 97. It's just a thin little thing, whereas... This year, it's a full-on El Nino signal already, and we're not even really in El Nino yet. So, you decide whether you think the CFS model, let's see if we can do this, if the CFS model is right or wrong, given that historical perspective. I don't know, it seems like it's probably, if anything, a little bit on the conservative side. All right, let's wrap this up. So what's going on immediately? Well, a little southern hemi swell, a little bit more forecast into California midweek and even Hawaii. Nothing huge, but steady, small southern hemi swell for probably into the weekend beyond that. So something to ride. Looking longer term, uh, jet stream, maybe a little gale forecast, a trough in the southeast Pacific again out about a week or five days or whatever it was. But nothing major on the horizon in terms of swell production. Not really unexpected given the atmosphere still thinks we're in La Nina. That said, looking at all the data, it seems like the trend, uh, given the Southern Oscillation Index, is towards the atmosphere thinking that we are moving 
towards El Nino. Again, I don't think that real that pattern is really going to become noticeable until we get in July, but I would think sometime later July, maybe the southern hemisphere might wake up. The troughing pattern, which has been in the southeast Pacific, might start dragging more back towards New Zealand, giving us putting Hawaii in a better position and uh, s spots that favor more of a southwest direction than a pure south direction will wake up and do their thing. But again, all a bit of conjecture. We're not sure. Clearly, we're in summer right now. Rain's over. Snow's over. The big melt happening, but not so bad in the Sierra in terms of the, the, the rate at which it's melting. Steadily rather than episodic and erratic, which is probably a good thing for people living on rivers downstream. All right. So that's our forecast for this week. We will not do a video next week. Uh, I've got some things going on. I won't be able to do it, but certainly the week after that we will. You all have the experience now. You've been watching these videos. You know where to get all the data from. It's all there on Storm Surf. You can go look, and we will do it again two weeks from now. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for going on this journey with us. It's a lot of fun, and it's only going to get more exciting as we get into fall and winter. So that's it for now. Go surf, go have some fun, stay safe, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for watching.